Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. (laughs) Jim is eating... What is that? I am eating a Nature Valley sweet and salty cashew bar. Cashews. Are you, are you listening to this? I can, can you believe this? The audacity of eating cashews <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Unbelievable. What am I? What am I dealing with? I need a new co-host. Oh, <laughs> hey, did you hear? Uh, Am Amson Axes is uh, going on hiatus. Really? Yep. Uh, they are quote unquote, and I'm making the thing with my fingers retooling their podcast. Oh, so they're changing up their format. Uh, it sounds like Mick Marcelino might be the only one coming back to me. That's that's kind of it. Was like, oh well, Jeff Bober was like, well, we don't want to do the same thing over and over forever, and it's almost yeah, like he's, were, he made a comment yeah. about not having enough time to do things because I think his mm-hmm. amp company's starting to pick up. Yeah, so it's almost like, all right, it's time for me to back out of this. You know, well, because Marcelino was really using Bober as a way to get to. Interviews. Well, once, I think they were. I think they were both. Like, they're they're good friends anyway. So. Um, oh yeah, no, no. I don't mean using him in a bad way. I'm just you say uh, using well, his, his connection. <laughs> yeah, of course, I would too. So, um, Jim, uh, yes, there's sir. there's some stuff I have to do every episode. If you if you require, if you remember, okay. require. Uh, Go for are it. you a regular listener? Why not? Subscribe to the Practical Guitarist using your chosen podcast app. Take the time to put an interview with the service where you found our podcast, like iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Get involved. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash Practical Guitarist. If you can find us on Twitter, you can, as at Practical Guitarist. If you're interested in supporting the show, we have launched a Threadless store at practicalguitarspodcast.threadless.com. If you'd like to donate money to this show, there's always Patreon. Our Patreon is available at patreon.com slash practicalguitarist. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can do some questions at practicalguitarist.com. And maybe we'll get back to you. No, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim is over here fondling his uh, Akai MPK mini controller. Actually- Actually, I've only bought, finally bought, I haven't actually opened the box all the way. I got it this far. <gasps> oh, look at that. Look There's, at that. Dave. Hey, who'd have thought there were keys in there? I got to be honest with you. So uh, it came today and it was on the porch. I picked up the box. I said, this box had better have more than a box of candy in it. This thing doesn't weigh. Yeah, anything. they're usually pretty light. Yeah, that's not surprising look, at all. And it comes with free um, Foam. ends. A foam. Yeah. Foam and styrofoam. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful for the environment. What a oh, this is it. California's gonna sue these. Now guys. you need now you need some cement glue. And and of course your USB port um and some stuff. I won't pull this out to right now. I'll do that when we get done. No, I would I would appreciate I really if you keep it in I, using this for some of my lesson stuff that we're I, gonna talk about today. Really appreciate you keep it in your pants. That would be that would be wonderful. Well, I, this thing's too big to put in my pants. Uh, not that. <laughs> you, you said you were going to pull it out. <laughs> no, 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 the keyboard. <laughs> I was, conser- uh, I was concerned. Be. So after I did all some this shopping puss- yesterday. After this all this pussy our- mountain that's been going on lately, I'm really concerned. <laughs> this is our second uh, get good, right? Uh, yes. We're going to do, yeah. Uh, shit. So we Where have we to talk. About- Jim, before we do anything, we got we got to address the controversy at hand. I've already brought up the pussy melder. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we got to talk about the the pussy melter mark too. Yes. So it's gone from a preset to a real pedal, yeah. a real life pedal. That and my his, that nose was is response. not even growing. My nose is not even growing. Like I'm not lying at all. I <laughs> honestly am sitting here just kind of like flabbergasted because I saw it yesterday and I was like, "What?" I saw that on um, Facebook. Uh, I thought that was one of the funniest things <laughs> because he pretty much just said, "Q, I'm doing it." And I'm gonna make we're gonna make a pedal out of it. Um, a, a podcasting acquaintance Ryan Burke has uh, has already begun his campaign uh, against whoever's making this pedal. Well, that's not really a campaign, really? but he's making light of it. So what he did was he made a pedal called the um, what did he call it? He 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 mocked up a pedal with with art called the Toxic Masculator or something like that. <laughs> it's Toxic Masculizer. And it, dude, okay. it's funny when you see it. Like you're like, that could be a legit pedal, and it has like 
somebody pointed out, and I'm not really sure if it was intended, but it has, it's like a, on the, the for the art on it, there's like a, a, um, a, a barrel, and inside mm-hmm. the barrel are all these green, like, it looks like green goo, you know, like radioactive goo, but if you look closely, it could be a pile of green dicks. Oh, no. <laughs> and I think it actually is, might actually have supposed to have been that. Green um, wieners. I, let me see if I can find the picture real quick, because I'll describe it to our listeners, and, and it, it is... Well, we'll have to link it. Yeah, I'm going to have um, to. Uh, you know, all right, so the whole thing is kind of blown up out of proportion in the, um, in the light of what happened. Um, again, I don't want to get into whether I think it's a right or a wrong thing because I just don't care. Yeah, well, it doesn't. It doesn't even pop onto my radar. That band doesn't pop onto my radar. It's not going to but affect whether said, I buy pedals from this builder. I mean, right? But what is it? The that I'm looking for right now. It's the toxic masculizer. I think. Yeah, you look up that one. I'm looking up the the, uh, new, uh, pedal. the, the new pussy melter. Uh. Oh yeah, you can buy it right at store.steelpantherrocks.com. Yeah, they're selling it through their site, which is great. Oh yeah, two hundred bucks. I'm telling you right now, I'd be surprised. It says right on it, um, parental advisory. I love this explicit distortion. <laughs> so it's its settings are dirty, load, booty, and sizzle. Oh my god! And th- no, th- actually, his might actually be worst. Um, t- just because, just because it like it speaks so harshly of you know the the way that men are perceived in the media right now, yep. and um, <laughs> I sent you, uh, I sent it to you. It says toxic masculizer. The uh, the knobs are well actually gaslight, milady, butt hurt. <laughs> there are two. There are two. It's always on, by the way. And there are two foot switches, which are insecurity boost and overcompensate. And then there's a switch that says P- I saw this. PC or SJW. Yep. <laughs> SJW. Oh my god. I don't god. even know, dude. I don't even know. I saw this and I was like, oh I'm god. a man, I have to have this. Like I have to. So yeah, but I, it's not gonna have any. Somebody's real, I mean, gonna have to build this thing. <laughs> like it's gonna have to yeah, happen. Yeah, but what are you gonna do with it? What would PC be? What would they, this is more of that suck knob on the on the it, it just has no. I, I don't. I don't ever intend to say. use it. I'm not going to use it, Jim. I'm just going to hang it on my wall. <laughs> this is I hilarious. Don't now, I don't know. as far as the pussy melter controversy goes, everybody's trying to figure out who's actually building these things for Steel Panther, and it they look so much like the Kirk Hammett line of pedals. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of people thinking that it's coming from the same builder, which is somehow I'm. I don't know. That that look is just generic. That's a generic box. I'm willing to bet you it doesn't do much at all. Well, it's, but the thing is, the knob layout and everything comes directly from the Kirk Hammett line of pedals. Like, they're already pre-drilled that way. Top jacks and all. So, yeah, it's yeah, moist you, um, and a gushing setting. So, I, I guess uh, the guy that does the KMDH pedals already came out and said, no, we're not building it. Oh, by the way, it also has... The input is stick it in, and the um, output is pull out. Oh I'm willing to bet God. you that this pedal absolutely does nothing. And, uh, well, it might be just a plain distortion pedal. Yeah, but, it's probably a drive um, pedal of some all sort. All I'm saying is, this is going to be... All right, so there was a... Um, I don't know if you remember this. So uh, maybe two years back, there was this pedal that somebody had put on their board... And they said, "Yeah, I'm rocking this pedal," and it had a, a naked woman. On yeah. It. Okay. All right. So before remember we, that? Yes, I absolutely remember. Let me go down this road. And I put on there. I don't think that I would play that out. I just don't think it would be appropriate to have on a board in any club situation. And I must have gotten attacked by fifty people from the uh, sixty cycle hum group who said I was being too uptight. Oh no, I don't. That I don't think that was sixty cycle, Jim. Yeah, it was. No, we'll go back and, yeah. we'll, and we'll dig it out. Because I only have, yeah, I only have. Uh, at that time, I think I was part of sixty cycle hum. Was the only Facebook. No, see, the reason why I say I don't think it was because we 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 routed several people because they were like, oh, this is fine, and it like so it's not a naked woman, right? That's the thing. It's it's a woman. It is literally breasts and and yeah. lower. No yeah. face, so yeah. it's completely like turning the the female form and body into an object, right. which is why people flipped the fuck out, and we were all like, 
everybody I know over in that group was like, fuck this. Like, yeah. who who the hell built this thing? And, uh, yeah, so. Yep. And when I got, when I said I would not put that on my board, I got a, I got a ton of people that just came and ripped on me. From, from, I took a three week, I took a three week break from the group for that, for that reason. I don't know. I, I don't remember any of that ever going on, Jim. I think you're, <laughs> you're probably thinking of like pedal boards of doom or something. I'm not part of pedal boards of doom. Never have them. Oh, well, I don't, I, I've never even been to it. I don't go to. Um, I know that only... pedal got shared in a bunch of places, including Instagram. So it, oh, and that's sure. very possible. It may have either. ended up somewhere else, but um, nevertheless, okay. nevertheless, yeah. I mean, they're over at least over in the sixty cycle hum group. They tend to be very like uh, they they can be kind of like this isn't so bad about certain things, but stuff like that, like if it, it, I, that they would have thrown the line there. I know there's a lot of people that that, that did not. They were pissed about the pussy melter too. And the uh, preset, and I just don't care. Like it's yeah. not even. It's a drop. It's not in the on bucket. my radar. It's same thing with this. Yeah. I'm not going to run out and buy this. They're they, they're not even getting retailers to buy this. It's going to be sold through their site for their fans. Of course it is, so, and, it, and and like ten people will buy it. Yeah, it takes um, two thousand dollars probably for the guts of a of a twenty dollar pedal. Yeah, it's well, I don't know what's in it. It might be just a tube streamer. Surprised to find out it's a Joyo on the inside. Oh, I figure it's probably a tube streamer, but. Um, yeah, it's probably whatever. that KMDH pedal, the the tube screamer with four knobs and the and the switch in the middle. Yeah. I, the guy the guy was very quick to be like, "No, I'm not making it." And it's like, "Are you? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. are you? Like, he, it, almost like he knew this was coming, you know?" Um, so it wasn't me. It's wasn't me. Yeah, whatever. It makes a difference. Um, I I hope that you know if you can take anything away from this, like everybody, when you see this kind of crap on the internet. Just, just shut up. Don't pile on each other. Like it's well, not worth it. Well, what happens is this is the thing that uh, just like um, anything else. Once you share this stuff, it's just like mentioning Kim Kardashian. Now she gets, now she gets fame for it. Right, right. There's no reason for this thing to be famous. It didn't do anything. It didn't. The only people that made it. I, this never would have. Yeah, if that ever controversy had never happened, up. it wouldn't be like this right now. If somebody hadn't said, "Ew, this pisses me off." Nobody would have known it existed. Yeah, so I don't know. It's it's a That's whole where thing. I, I'm like, now they're going to make a few thousand dollars on it. I'll bet you. Oh, for fucking sure. I'm sure. I'm sure they will. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, they'll probably sell out of these things. There's enough people that are <laughs> like, I'm. Uh, this is PC bullshit, and you know, like the Trumpers yep. that that you know, yep. that, they'll buy it. People will buy it. And it it's, People will buy it. But I just this is going to be a limited run thing, and it's and then it'll be gone, and we don't have to worry about it ever and, again. And absolutely no, um, uh, Steel Panther fans will be lost in the, in the yeah in the making of this pedal, <laughs> no. anyway, or, in the, or in the controversy thereof. I mean, we're talking about a band that sings about glory holes. Do you think they give a shit? Their fans they, they, give a when, shit about this thing. Yeah, when you've got a song called Asian Hooker, yeah, the last thing you need to do, you know, last thing you're worried about is the PC group. Yeah, and uh, and the last thing they should be worried about is the name of their pedals. <laughs> I mean, if you were listening to their lyrics, the last thing you should yeah. be worried about. That's pedals. why I'm like, all right, whatever. Anyway, so this week we're actually going to talk about guitar and not equipment for a change. We are going um, to talk about playing guitar. Well, we'll try to avoid equipment. But, yes. Yeah. Jim, so you have been investing some time in uh, Fretboard Logic, which is yes. a so I, pretty well-known I bought, book. Yeah, so I bought the Fretboard Logic um, system for, like, I got a military discount. It was like 60 bucks or whatever at, uh, at Guitar Center. Anyway, um, because I don't like taking lessons because I don't like to be logged down into stuff. And I got the Fretboard Logic, so I got the, um, the books, yep. two books. There's not a lot in these books, man. No, they're they're not that big. They're like less than 100 pages. Uh, but the print is huge. Uh-huh. It's, it is geriatric huge, which yep. is good because I'm old. Um, <laughs> it's funny because they're selling educational material to people who should know this shit already. <laughs> so anyway, really it goes down to the cage system. The guy does everything he can to try to convince you that it's not pentatonic scales. Oh, well, he does say that it's pentatonic, but he, what I didn't agree with, he comes out and he says um, uh, in here that uh, the Greek scales of modes are bullshit, that don't worry about them. The only thing you need to know is pentatonic scales. Now, this is a guy that has been, you know, talking crap. He 
he bounces. I I love that. I love what he just said. That like the only thing you need is a pentatonic scale. Like, what are you gonna do with the other like you know two notes that you drop? Yep. Like, so in- <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just flabbergasted that somebody would say that. I don't. I barely use pentatonics. I mean, I mean, I use them, but like, I'm a diatonic guy. You know, I want those extra notes. I want to have them on tap if I need them. Yeah. So, he uses them. He uses, but he calls it the chromatics, <laughs> obviously. Oh my but god! He comes back and says, "I'm going to a diatonic scale." <laughs> and I just, I thought it was interesting. Um, it's been interesting reading so far. Um, obviously, based on the fact that you can move the C, A, G, E, and D chords up and down the right now at first i said now wait a minute because this is me i'm like caged makes no sense to me because the c is a d chord in the zero position right right that's correct because of the way they map out the patterns for the cage system actually c is not the d chord c is a c chord and d is a d chord because you put the you put the bar the finger in a different position relative to place of the chord. So. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as it's got a C, an E, and a G in it, yeah. <laughs> it's a C chord in my opinion. And, and that, and, and like, I don't give a fuck what voicing it's at. I can play that damn thing all over the neck. Like, it doesn't make any difference. Just so that they can say, okay, there's five patterns and five. Yeah. That's, that's what always got me about the cage system is that like, they want to do a lot of arbitrary things just so they can have like a consistent system. They want to make it into a system. I'm like, it's not a system. It's music. Like, what the hell? <laughs> so we both know. Or, all right. So we both <clears> looked at the way you look at the fretboard. Both of us look at it a little yeah, differently. Yeah, we, we, we talked about it right before this episode. So uh, why don't and you I go? Think, yeah, why don't you go through how you do it, and then we'll go through how I do it, and then we can talk about and then we'll talk about the the differences and the and the similarities. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, when I was looking at uh, the way I look at a fretboard, if I'm going to play a pentatonic scale, this is not the this is not the way I play a diatonic scale. All right, we're not in. Right. I'm just talking about major minor pentatonics. Um, so I only have to worry about three patterns. But the the thing that that um, I look at is I see the I see the guitar fretboard like a keyboard. That's what I was ta- like telling you. So when you say patterns, you don't mean positions, right? Or you mean positions? Patterns. Yeah, but are you talking about, like, in different positions? So you can play what? the A what? pentatonic that exists at the fifth fret, and then you can you can play it starting on a different note at a different fret and, and have a different position. That's Is that the same thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm right, just making sure. Yeah, it, it, as far as up and down the fretboard positions, <clears throat> I have three patterns in three positions. But I look at I look at only five strings because one string repeats, right? Right. So I don't really think about the fact the second the higher E is a second E. I just know that's an E, right, e right. string, and my brain doesn't need to. Now it's the way my brain works. Everybody is different. Um. So the other thing that um, I look at is they're they're in pairs. <clears throat> so the guitar, if I look at um, G E through G, but I put the B. Now, now I do this because I, pl- I I learned this on a seven string, but <clears throat> if I put the B at the bottom and I forget about the higher B, then what I have is a true tuned to fourths guitar, right? Mm-hmm. So I have B E A D G low to low to high, uh, B E A D G, right? And that means that um, if you look at the patterns um, on your on your guitar and you look at the the um, the way that uh, you've got your your minor pentatonic, it's always going to be starting at the root, a minor third, a second, a second, right? You've got such as an A pen, a minor pentatonic. You've got a minor third, then you've got a second, a second, a minor third, a second, a second, a minor third. So the pattern repeats all over. Now, what, like you were saying, that means that in the positions, if if I know the pattern. If I know I'm playing a minor third and then a second, mm-hmm. I can under because I can go down, go. I, I, I say down, I mean up in in tone, two strings. Um, so if I jump from my E string to my D string, and as we all know, then I jump up two frets, I'm at the same note. Right. 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 So if I jump from a G to a G, I can get to the same 
same note by going um, two strings higher in tone and two frets higher. Now I'm at I'm at an octave, and it, and the I think the key instead of learning a bunch of dumbass patterns to knowing how to get around your guitar yeah. is to know where your intervals are. Yes, you can find intervals fourths, fifths, octaves, thirds, minor thirds. You've you've got this down. Yeah. So, Jim, Jim, that's exactly the way that I perceive things. So I learned, and I don't. As we mentioned, I I knew pentatonics like that's when I first started off playing. Obviously, oh. usually the first scale you learn on guitar. Um, and later on, I got into the diatonics and diatonic minor specifically because I think it's really easy to get under the fingers. And this is how I learned everything. And I'm I'm holding up my piece of paper that Jim is just holding up his. Um, and mine is basically so you have five seven eight five seven eight on the E and the A string, and then when you get to the D string, you have five seven, and seven is the octave, right? So obviously, if I can use that five seven eight five seven eight and just add two frets to it, then I got the next I got the next pattern, right? So it's seven nine ten seven nine ten, and then add infinitum, just bearing in mind that B shifts back one. So um, because the fact of where it is on the guitar and it's tuned to a third versus a fourth under the G. Right, right. So once you get once you get it, like you just cement it in your mind, you never think about it again. Right. Um, and honestly, like. I never went through the, oh, well, I need to learn how to play an A minor scale at the second fret. Like, I never did any of that. It, it just never, because I could do it already. Like, once I figured out octaves, all I had to know is how to go an octave up and an octave down. And once right. I figured that out, I was like, shit, what do I need this for? Like, exactly. I, and, then, and then I heard people talking about caged. Like, oh, I'm taking lessons and they're teaching me caged and all this. And I'm like, the hell you need that for? And they'd show me what caged was, and they'd show me these patterns. I go, okay, so what? <laughs> like, I can already do that. <laughs> and I think that comes into perspective, right? We all learn differently. All we sure, all learn sure. to look at things differently. I see the guitar as a circle, but I started. I started, you know, um, by looking at the keyboard, right? So when it came to theory, I knew how to play the guitar before, but I never knew any theory. Here's the other thing. I was just, I was just telling somebody because they asked me, how do you spell a chord? I said, look, a major chord is easy. It's a major third and a minor third. That's a chord. If you could go major third, minor third, because you're going a major third to your first note and a minor third from that note relative from the major third note, Mm -hmm. a minor third from that note, that's a chord because that's your third and that's your fifth. And then if it's a minor, it's a minor third, major third. So it's major third, minor third, or minor third, major third. If you can look at it that way, then again, you don't need to memorize all these ridiculous patterns. They're, yeah. they're useless, right? There's only a couple of patterns you really need to know. I mean, that's so. Nevertheless, so Jim and I were comparing notes last night, and right. one of the and one of the funny things <laughs> one of the funny things we did, right? So Jim goes, "Oh, it's like show me these major pentatonics things," and he's like, "It's really cool," and I'm like, "Yeah, I know major pentatonics," but I'm laughing because I'm like. I'm like he, he plays them wrong. <laughs> no, it's not that I play them wrong. I when I think pentatonic, all I think is five note scale, right? Five notes. So five, yeah. it's like a hexatonic. Really with hexatonic is eight, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah, so hexatonic, uh, pentatonic, and what I actually have done, and this is just something I got bored playing the the regular like major pentatonic, minor pentatonic, major diatonic, major di- or minor diatonic, and then of course harmonic minor and harmonic major and all those things. I I got bored and I was like, well. We know we know there are modes, right? So what happens if I take a major scale and I drop? Because if you take a minor scale, like A minor, you're dropping. And I think it's your second. it's your second and your sixth, right? That's right, second and the sixth. All right, so you take that, and then you take your major diatonic scale and you drop your second and your sixth, which is not what you do in the major pentatonic. It, no, not at all. It, it, that's that's not how you learn. <laughs> But well, that works for you. It works. Well, you can hear it. Like, so I'm sure you played my example last night, and you're like, what the hell? I did. And it doesn't sound unmusical. That's, that's why I went, what the fuck? It doesn't sound <laughs> no, it unmusical. Doesn't sound like it sounds good. It's now, so- I'm going to ask you this. When you play, because th- there were some questions I asked you. I'm going to bring them up here. Yeah. You, got, you, got, that- you want me to go over them, right? No, no. I'm, I'm, so, yeah. So when you play, um, do you play... Oh my gosh, we we I think it was three o'clock in the morning when we were talking. No, oh, it was like midnight. After midnight, yeah. After midnight, um, so I I said this will be good a good discussion. So here's the question: 
<clears throat> when you're playing your your version of the major pentatonic scale, which there's nothing wrong with that. There's five <laughs> versions, there's five notes. Yeah. That in in theory, that means that it is a pentatonic scale. Right. It may not be the pentatonic no, scale. No, it's just a, but it is a scale. pentatonic scale. Yeah. Right. And I honestly think you should draw it up, and and we'll put those pictures. Of oh, our, if if our I got drawings. time, we'll, yeah. If I got time, we'll post them. And they may not be in the yeah. show notes at first, uh, but they will be in the the podcast group eventually. So yeah, we'll put them in the co- in the podcast group. The um uh the interesting thing that that I look at here is you're looking at a different way. So how do you apply that? Let's say you're playing in um you're playing over a major. I'm assuming you're playing over a major scale that you're um. You're in. How do you apply your major pentatonic to your major scale? Okay, so I sent you two. One is the Lydian, um, which is yep. which has got a raised fourth, and yep. then the other one is um, the other one is just like a regular diatonic. Um, the raised fourth one that's going to so basically it's the same rules you used to use like a major scale, right? So if you're going to play A major, then you can play the A major scale over it, or if you're going to play the relative minor, you can obviously use the A major scale over it. Or if you have a chord progression that's in A major, then you can use that scale over it because and and it, and it works because there's no different notes. You're just choosing to leave some out. That's all you're doing. And so Absolutely. when you do the Lydian though, it gets different because yeah, like everybody knows. Well, if you don't know, you know this now. If you use a major seven chord, you can play Lydian over it. That raised fourth actually sounds sweeter, and a lot of people prefer it to using a, a regular major scale. So. Anyway, what were you saying, Jim, before you shoved food in your mouth? Those are sweet tarts. Ugh. All right. And it came from... Sweet came water. From sweet water. Now I can't open my mouth because... <laughs> Jim! They are sour. Oh, my God. All right, so let's look at... Am I muted? I'm not muted. Am no, I? you're not. I can hear everything you're saying in chewing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I meant to mute when I put that in my mouth. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we we're staying away from that pedal. But we're staying away from that pedal. Um, so when you play that, here's here's the danger that a lot of people um, when they're playing and they're and they're going along. The one question they always have, especially when you play outside the minor te- minor pentatonic, always works. It yes, always it works even works. against major chords. It works against the major scale and, and dominant chords. Minor scale. Yep. Why? Because you're never okay. stepping on the notes in the scale. If you play the major scale or the minor scale, you're never stepping on. Because if you're playing, someone would say, well, what if you're playing a minor third chord? Or, yeah, a, um, a minor third chord. So what? I'm playing, uh, I'm playing um, as long as I don't sit on the major third for a long time. Or I mean, I'm sorry, if I play a major third, what if you're playing a, you play a um, minor pentatonic over a major third chord so mm-hmm. what i'm playing the flats or i mean the the seven the, uh, yeah. the major seven right of the chord right that doesn't that doesn't sound bad over the chord so and there's a, that's another thing too is like so there's there's really two approaches to how you use these scales in practice so right. there's, there's three right there's one that's the harmonic approach where you're going to actually use these to create a harmony um yep. and that that's where things get a little bit more complicated but there, yeah. the other two is if you're doing single note lines or you're playing a melody line, for example, um, right. you can either take the jazz, what I consider the jazz approach, which is, all right, so for each chord, I'm going to use the appropriate scale, right? Or right. for these two chords, I'll use this scale because there's a common element there. And then for these two chords, I'll use this scale. I, I have never been that guy. I look for the path of least resistance. So if I look at the chord progression, I go, <laughs> it's, in, it's in A major. I'm going to go for, you know, either A major, F sharp minor and be like, that's it. And all I have to do is hit my, so I will try to, if I end a, a line or something on a different chord, I'll try to end it on the appropriate note for that chord. So like, let's say you have an a, an F sharp major or an F sharp minor chord, right? Then I'm going to end on F sharp rather than A. And then if I start a new line, I'll try to, I'll try to carry that through. But I mean, I don't think about that. It, honestly, it's just reflex now. Like my lines end that way, because because I know what I know what my ears like. Um, so uh, my approach is a totally auditory one. I I've learned a lot of theory over the years. I stopped learning theory five or six years ago 
because I was like, you know what? At this point, I, I know enough that I can sit down, I can compose a piece of music, I can play piano. I, I know more about theory when it comes to those other instruments, but when I get on guitar, I'm so fluent with the way that I, I approach it now that I, and, 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 and fluid as well, that right. I, it just doesn't occur to me anymore. I'm just like, all right, so I'm just going to play this chord progression now. And it's, and I don't even think about the note names. I don't think about what scales work best here. I just guide, my ears guide me and my fingers guide me and they know what works. And, and I just, I'm along for the ride sometimes. So, okay. So let me ask you this, because I, I agree with you, all right? And a lot of what um, I think we both do uh, is that we both look at um, uh, guitar differently, but certainly we look at it um, in a way that sounds good, right, to our ears. But we both come from a different place, right? You come from... Um, a place that's got a lot of blues and some yeah, influences. a lot of improvisational stuff. Im- improvisation, where I come from, a lot of pop and um, uh, country and and uh, rock. Yeah, background. a lot more structured approach, right. approaches to those forms too. Correct, and so um, this is where it'll be interesting to see what the difference is. So, really, what we both talked about as far as our way of looking at the fretbird 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 uh, oh, PRS the fretbird is the yeah the the PRS fretbird <laughs> is the same thing we actually do the same thing we look at it the, we are looking at the same thing differently we have a different perspective yeah you you like to look at um or you look at the patterns um and your patterns move yeah i mean with it's to- guitar is a really visual thing when i play it Absolutely. so he's that you're not lying it's very much pattern based Absolutely. And we do, I don't care who you are, you do follow into, fall into some licks. Um, oh, yeah, no, a- absolutely, because that's when you go on autopilot. Right, when you go on autopilot. And you were asking me, because you said <clears throat> about um, playing. When I go to play, I have to have, I have, to have one of two um, ways to think. Is my, are my hands on autopilot or is my mouth on autopilot? Right. Because I sing most of the time. Doing pop music, there's a lot of vocal, right? There's mm-hmm. very little um, guitar. Even even in some of those popular guitar-oriented pop songs, very little guitar going on. But you take some of those those songs, and they do have solos rolling over top, right, of right. the vocal. Mm-hmm. And I have to think, okay, am I playing this rote? Because if I don't play this rote, then I can't think vocally how to inflect or am i going to play this this way and then my brain is just shut off to my mouth and it's just going and i'm i'm a rambling man so to speak right yeah yeah think Uh, about that song and i used that as a as an example on purpose so rambling man look listen to all the stuff that's going on during the vocal mm -hmm. go ahead go ahead so my I, I I'm completely following you. I, I agree completely with what you're saying about how you know how you approach it. Um, the the difference I I think in the way that I look at it, especially when I'm going on autopilot, if the music's good, my autopilot's going to be great. So if I'm feeling what what's going on, I can just I can rip. But that's the thing. Like I've had to work on, and a lot of people practice. You know. They sit around and they they practice the same tunes or whatever that they're going to do in their set. You and I work on practice, practicing on building emotion without any like stimulus. I'll sit there and say, "How do I make myself go off like that without having to, like w- if they're playing like shit?" You know what I mean? Like, how do I do that yeah. if they're if the drummer's not following along? Like, and I spend a, a, a significant amount of resources doing this. I feel I feel so new age about it too because like I've heard. Um, I've heard Steve Vai describe it as play a chord that sounds like a waterfall or something like that. And it's just that that's yeah. exactly my approach. And it's it's so hilarious because it's just it's just bad. So. Yeah, well, no, there's nothing wrong with that. So um, but when I do it, OK, um, I'm getting up in front of a group of people and I'm not saying that improvisational musicians don't do this. I'm getting up in front of a group of people, but there's an expectation from the music that I play. It's going to be close to, if not exactly, certain things. 
Like, um, I'll give you an example. The intro to Dancing With Myself by Billy Idol. Mm -hmm. That's got to start with that drum beat. And it's got to be that nice, cool, swinging 4-4 drum beat. Right, 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 right. Slightly ahead of the beat. And then in comes that da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, right? We talked about that before. Now, that has got to be dead on. Because if I don't do that dead on, the other guy's doing the singing. And yeah. if I don't play that dead on, guess what I do? I throw him off. Yeah. Yeah. His timing's gone. Now the bass player's timing's gone. Now the drummer can't keep up. So guess what? Everybody, it's 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 a team effort. Now I'm not I'm not putting down the three the the three guitar or I mean the one guitar band stuff. Yeah. The, the Hendrix, the Stevie Ray Vaughan, the yeah. Cream, the the Zeppelin. I'm not putting that down. But what I'm saying is, um, for the most part, once you add a second melodic instrument, you have even though we could we could argue that vocals we there's no argument, vocals are a melodic instrument. Yeah. Um once you add melodic instruments that are going on at the same time as each other, you have got to be careful about this, right? I've had the same problems with with just drums and bass, to be honest yeah. with you. And it's I don't think I don't think I guess melody is obviously going to get you called out immediately if if you got yes. two guys clashing, but um, I'll tell you right now, like people can tell when your when your rhythm section sucks and when your and well, when your guitar player can't lock in with your rhythm section. Um, yes. And it, and and what you're the, the phenomenon you're you're talking about really becomes magnified by the fact that you have one instrument starting and then the other instruments come in, or yep. one instrument comes in at a time or whatever. And that and and those portions of of music in general are very difficult to pull off correctly. Because if somebody's off, it throws everybody off. And that's not a unique right. situation at all. And, well, uh, what I was getting at, though, let's say that I decided, you know what? Today, I'm going to improvise over that. So instead of playing, I play, yeah. Which is fine if, 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 if the, the song is structured that way. But exactly. it's not. But so what's it said? You're playing a structured piece, and I play structured pieces too. But I'm just saying, like, dude, I love the way you said that. Well, I play structured pieces too. No, I do. But I'm, <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, I'm not immune to this, Jim. Like I've seen this oh, no, stuff I before. I, I'm just saying that. I, uh, no, no, I don't. I don't argue. That's why I said I'm not saying that, that the improvisational musicians don't have structured parts. What I'm saying is that okay, take take David Gilmore for example. Obviously, I'm a huge fan. He never played Comfortably Numb the same way twice, right? Mm -hmm. But he introed the solos and outro the solos the same way, almost right. always the same they way. They call it bookending. Right. So by bookending that solo the same way, what he didn't have to worry about in the middle, the band was like, I don't care what you're going to do. Yeah. You can ramble on. Well, but when I when I mentioned Ramblin' Man earlier, think about the guitar that's going on during Ramblin' Man. And, it, and if you don't... Use that. Think about the double stops that go on during the vocal part of Brown Eyed Girl. A lot of people are like, oh, Brown Eyed Girl sucks. It's just G, D, C, and D. Yeah? Okay. Play that double stop part all the whole way through. So, you see what I mean? It's, yeah, but... All right. So we're back to the same discussion I know we've had before, where um, understanding improvisational music and understanding structured music, they're, they're just two completely different things. And so... Right. Even even if you're to sit there and say, okay, so David Gilmore is going to do his book in solo, right? That's improv. Right. Well, no, it's not because it's structured. They sit there and they say, okay, we're going to have the book in the book in. This is what you listen for. Like, I'll do yep. anything I want in the middle. It's right. not It's not like the Grateful Dead where they come out and they're so heavy on acid that, like... Oh, good Lord. That that they don't know what they're going to do, you know? And every nobody knows what the hell they're going to do. Um, right. And, including them. And, and that's... I, I don't... I'm not big on that style of music either. I'm nope. more like I come from like more the jazz school of improv where it's like, okay, we're going to have a head and, you know, but we're going to book in the whole piece of music. And then in the middle, I'm going to point to somebody and they're going to take a solo. Like that's right. more that. And it's not, we, we don't actually point at people if I, if I'm playing with somebody, but like, they'll give you the look, you know, <laughs> or, or something. And you'll know like, okay, I'm supposed to step out now. Um, yeah. But it, that's an organizational thing. So we don't use necessarily the structure of the music to know what the hell we're supposed to be doing. 
it's more based on the band leader being like, okay, your turn. You know, it's um, that. That's important. Absolutely. So and how you cue, it's all it's cues and signals or audible cues, right? Because we can use audible cues. The drummer can start to go, sure. Prap, 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 sure. You know, because uh, who is it? Buddy Rich? Yeah. Right. Band leader. Mm. Um, and uh, he didn't have to say a word. No. Everybody knew where he was going. Well, I mean, you know, Jimmy, or not Jimmy, uh, Frank Zappa used to compose on stage and he used to use hand <laughs> signals tell the band what to do. And he had this complicated system of hand signals he had to learn if you were Frank's band. And so if you think about it from that perspective, yeah. I mean, that's really, this, it's not improv at that point. Like, he's give, oh. he's telling you what to do. Um, Absolutely. It's just how, how generic are the instructions. And I, I think I mentioned this in our conversation last night. When, so, when I, when I step up and play now, it used to be, Ten years ago, I think I'm going to use this A minor ascending run, and I'm going to end on on uh, on a B on the on the high E string, right? Right. And like I would get that granular with it, and now it's I it's more like a paintbrush. I'm like I'm going to start on an A minor ascending, and then I'm going to end somewhere. <laughs> like I'm going to hold the best. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to take sixteen bars, and I'm no, just going to play. Yeah. So. Speaking of bars and speaking of all the stuff we've talked about, all right, this is the question I'm going to have for you because a lot of people, a lot of my students ask this, a lot of people ask me this, why is music theory important if all you care about is how it sounds? Because music theory explains how things sound. So that's we, we always have to stop and remind ourselves when we're talking about music theory that We've invented this thing called music theory, the, the set of rules and philosophies, in order to explain why things are that have naturally occurred. The first, may, maybe, and first, and maybe only musical idea that has ever held any gravitas through the ages is when Pythagoras sat down with a string and said, "If I divide it in half, that's an octave, and if I yep. divide that in half, that's a fifth." Like the, those that particular piece that you know and and that concept is maybe the only thing that happened prior to music and we don't know if he was actually doing that to explain something he'd already seen and right. and that's and that's probably more than likely the case so think about science in the same way we don't we didn't use science to create the universe but we try to use science to explain why the universe is does that, does that make sense it that makes sense to me the other thing that i try to tell my students is this if you can't, if I can't explain to you the, yeah, it's a language what thing. I want you to do, right, it's a language. When you learned, we we all know, uh, I'm old enough to remember people who, who were getting along in day-to-day life, and some people may even know some people like this now, who did not know how to read. Yep. That doesn't mean they couldn't do their jobs. It didn't mean they couldn't shop, and they couldn't, you know, write a check or whatever. But if they couldn't write and read... There were there were limitations in their lives, and I try to tell them that the limitation you're going to have is you can't express yourself to me, you can't express yourself to others. Right. You can express yourself musically and audibly in a in a musical sense, but what you can never do is tell me how it works. Because I I have this one guy he's learning all these um acoustic uh, things where they're taking pop pop music of today and doing all this solo acoustic stuff, and I said. I said, I know that sounds incredible to you, and I don't want to come across as a dick, but it's not that hard. If you want me to teach it to you, it's not that hard. What they're doing is extremely easy if you want me to teach it to you, but you have to be willing to sit down and say, okay, I'm willing to learn these scales, because without them, I can't teach you how to apply that when you want to learn a song on your own, because I can teach you that song and that song and that song. But all I'm teaching you is put this finger here. Put yeah, this you know that it's song. It's all mechanics. Right? I, have a, I have a cousin, and he may be a listener to the show, but um, I remember. So he he never really played in front of anybody, and and I was over there one time, and I had, I had my guitar with me, and they they wanted us to play together, and he brought his he brought his guitar up, and he played a song. We both played a song together, and it was funny because like he didn't know anything about how to how to like formulate a new musical idea on his own. He knew the songs that he had been taught, and he knew them very well. I mean, he was actually really good, but you ask him, if you asked him, for example, play a C major scale, he wouldn't know. And he was playing, like, 
some pretty complicated Metallica stuff, some 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 more challenging Guns N' Roses stuff, and it was like, but you but you don't know how to improvise. Like I I what what is this? Like you don't know hey, twelve bar a uh, twelve bar blues? Like <laughs> you know he, that's where um where it goes into where he's got tools in his box he doesn't know how to use. Yeah, he knows he has a he has a screwdriver. And if you tell him to screw that screw down to that position, that's fine. But he doesn't know he can use that screwdriver to go over here and do the same thing with that screw. Yeah, exactly. That's that is literally he has tools he doesn't know how to use. Now I think he still plays now. Um, and I I'm pretty well, certain did, I should. Say, I'm pretty certain I'm that, that yeah I'm pretty certain now he's like probably more advanced than he was and maybe I oh, I'd sure. like to think play, playing with somebody like me who'd not been playing that long. And could right. do a lot of the things that he did was kind of an eye opening experience in that like there's this whole other world of guitar out there, but I don't know. I'm, I'm probably not. <laughs> well, I know I, I knew this one guy who could not play unless it was exact. I mean, every swell, every note had to be exact length. The bends, if they were out of tune bends, he bent out of tune. I'm like, dude, you do realize that was a mistake. The, the the guitar player did not mean to bend out of tune. The audience will it. never know. <laughs> they Absolutely. will never know. <laughs> but he could not. He could not hear. He could not not hear. He could not play unless it was exactly what he was hearing on the quote unquote the record. So if it was slightly off tune, because like we've talked about before, the master was slightly sped up or slowed down. You know. Yeah, like had, any ACDC song is not in tune, right? He right. had a detune for every one of them because they were never in tune with each other, much less in tune with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, so a little known fact uh, part of the reason why they separated guitar players in the mix and put one on right or left, especially in bands like that, was because they were out of tune. <laughs> they were typically out of tune with each other. Yeah, you put them right on of top of each other, it's super obvious. Yep. Um, and, it, and it clashes, yeah. and that's that clash. So one of the other questions, I know we're coming up towards our hour, so we got other stuff to cover, and that's fine. We want to, this thing needs to grow. Um, so obviously now we know why theory is important and when to apply theory. It doesn't mean that theory is, it's just like when we write. I can write LOL, and people know that's laugh out loud, right? Mm-hmm. I do not have to write out laugh out loud. Yeah. I can say ain't, but ain't in the dictionary. Well, it might be now, but... Ain't ain't in the dictionary. Is, uh, basically, you you. The only reason that any language works is because it's two people have mutually agreed upon an intermediary concept or an intermediary sound, so we can speak it. So that's what Jim's getting at I, is that philosophy piece there, right? That it just because <clears throat> right, you have to know the rules before you can break them, right? That's that's what I'm getting to. So um, uh, the other thing is. Um, and I know we're coming up to our hour, so I don't want to go no, too we're far. For, we're forty-seven it. minutes. We got we got forty-seven time. minutes. Oh, yeah. good. So we can talk about. That's where I was. I asked, "What is the mix?" I don't mean the mix is in the bass is lower than the than the guitar, and where's the EQ and stuff. I mean the mix of um, the musician. So let's say you're a bass player. Mm-hmm. Most most of your beginning bass players do what? Uh, g- give it to me, Jim, because I don't know exactly where you're driving at. They play root notes. Yeah, well, okay. Which so. is easy to play over, right? Yeah. Or they play root fifths. Easy to play yeah. over. Yeah. And then your second, your intermediate guys will play a riff. So That's they'll right. know that they can play a couple of different notes in sequence, but they're not necessarily like arpeggios or something like that. Right. And then, you're, and and then so, your super advanced guy, he's doing walking bass lines. <laughs> exactly. And the danger of a walking bass line over a. Um, now, I'm not saying that you can't do it, but now we have to apply. What we know or what we hear differently over top of a walking bass line, right? Mm-hmm. Then I would, if I was playing um, over a bass player, just playing one five, and we were playing seven chords. Yeah, you better um, know your shit four, if you're going to play against a walking bass line like that. That's, that's exactly. all I can say. Um, exactly. I played with a guy that used to do that shit just to, just to bother me. Like he'd write songs and be like, here's the bass line, and it's a walking bass line. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> so I'd have to count the whole thing. It was like it was ridiculous. Um, Brian May, Brian May had to play over a lot of walking bass lines. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about mixes and like what makes up a, a musician, right? Like so. Right. For me, that mix of knowledge I'm, and, and I'm 75 percent lead player, um, yep. which means I'm really good with single notes. 
I'm probably, I wouldn't say 75%. I'd probably say 66%, well, 30%. No, you're, you're, no. you're probably right the first time. I'm probably, I'm probably, I, I watched your playing. Between, you, between 65 and 75% um, lead player. The other part, I spend completely comping. Like, that's, that's my thing. So I want to, I want to, when I sit down, I don't hey, play. David, before you go further, explain what comping is to those who may not. Um, so comping is like a, a rhythmic feel that you apply using your instrument. So and it doesn't necessarily, I guess, technically playing chords is comping yes. and strumming chords. But, but right. comping is so much more than that. And that's, yes. comping can be like doing slide ins to a chord or uh, playing single notes within within the structure of like a chord. Right. Or, or like Jimmy, chordal Jimmy melodies. Hendrix's type stuff where he's doing chordal mel- melodies or... Yep. Um, or the, the R and B style that he had, chord melody is actually something separate. But that's the point: is that it's, um, it's a different way of approaching the rhythm side of guitar. And um, well, it's not really even a different way. It's just how do you approach it? And so I spent a lot of time adjusting and coming up with unique comping styles, because frankly, you're going to spend a lot of time on the guitar accompanying people. You might as well figure yep. it out, and it can be super fun. If you can figure out a comping style that works for you and it's not boring as hell, you're gonna have a good yeah. time. Take the stray cat strut from uh um the stray cats. <laughs> I was like, what band is that? Oh, yeah, stray cats. Yeah. Stray uh, cat strut by the stray cats, right? Listen to that comp over the walking bass line that uh Setzer's using. Um another great great example of comping uh, is well, they're really all over the doors music, but um oh, yeah. um uh hell. Riders on the Storm. That's what I was yes. thinking of. Riders on the Storm. Riders on also yeah. Riders on the Storm. What the hell's wrong with me? If you listen if you listen to that song specifically, you'll hear um Robbie Krieger comping and doing things that are not necessarily like considered orthodox guitar technique, but they're just holding rhythm down and they yep. fit within the, the chordal context. Yep. So, yep. Anyway. Or listen to listen to Train Train from the Outlaws. hmm So uh, the point is if I if I had to apply a mix to myself of what I am, then that's probably where I would be somewhere in there. I would probably say I'd probably spend more time comping than I care to realize. Um, so that's why I said it's probably more like sixty five thirty five. Yeah. But that being said, I suck at rhythm. I mean, like, that I I have to get my rhythmic chops in order. So I can't even I can't even say rhythm instead of comping. I have to say comping specifically. So right, Jim, what are you? What do you, what's your mix? All right, so I, I do a lot more comping um, than lead. So when I'm on stage and I'm doing stuff, the other guy is playing the standard, you know, straight up chords, right? So typically he'll play um, uh, the, you know, the straightforward chord, whether it's an open or a bar chord, he'll go in that. So I'll comp around that um, to give it a a bit of a thing. So I know like, over C, I can play, you know, a G um, and still get away with it as long as I come back to the C, you know, um, or I'll slide up from a B into the C, even though he's right on C. But I, I have to realize that my B to come into that C so that we're to, on the C together is a um, my B is slightly ahead of the B. So I bring it in, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. So I do that. I do a lot of single note melodies. But I wouldn't call them solos. Wouldn't call them lead lines. I'd call them melodic lines. Um, I do a lot of uh, di- uh, uh, diads um, or triads where I don't play a whole chord. Yeah, I consider that. Given... I consider that comping usually. It, yeah, you, just using that stuff. Yeah, unless it's so in I'll... a solo context. But yeah, exactly. So let's say I'm playing in C. I know I can play the dyads um, over C. I know my major minor dyads over C. So I can use those whether I'm using two um, adjacent strings or separate strings um, so that I can give a little bit of flavor. Now, I don't. I might not do it the whole time. Like if you take, like I, I said earlier with uh, Brown Eyed Girl, that guy's playing dyads the whole time. He's playing yeah. those dyads the whole time through it. I might play, you know, like a bar of them and leave it out. Sure. Or, um, you know, and not play at all and stay out and then come in. So I know that there's space too. So that I would say it's probably more, I'm probably more, um, maybe 35, 40% rhythm. Um, and then, 
maybe 40%, 30% comping, and then the rest doing lead lines. But if if you could call some of the melody lines lead lines, maybe I'd get a little bit more out of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's not surprising. I mean, okay. Yeah, that's... yeah considering the kind of music I play, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm doing most of the time. I mean, if you think about it, you know, uh, take a song like um, uh, A675309 Jenny. Yeah, yeah. It's just like a healthy mix of everything. That's what's yeah. cool about some of those pop tunes is that they're not. So, like, if you're if you're playing straight rock music, I find that you'll find less music that has like melodic lines in it. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but like when yeah. you're playing more pop oriented rock music or just pop in general, like yeah. there's melodic lines everywhere. It, everything's freaking polyphonic. It's like damn fugue half the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's incredible. I mean. You know, I, I started playing a lot of the yacht. Well, what they used to call yacht rock, yacht rock has changed over the years. Um, and uh, dad rock, I guess. You know, um, you know, you take a song like um, uh, "Do You Like Pina Coladas?" What is that? Right. Escape the Pina Colada song. Yeah. You play, you you play that song. There is a lot going on in there. Right. A lot. Um, and so, a lot of people will take these pop songs. You see it all the time. You see these bar bands. They're playing um, these songs, and they're playing very badly. And when I say badly, I just mean that they're playing very simplistically. And there's so much more you could do if you actually listen down to the listen to the song, see what they're doing, and then maybe sometimes comp what the vocalist would have done here. Right. Because sometimes I'll I'll um, let's say I've got a vocal mel- melody that's coming up that's really high to accentuate what I'm doing. I'll play the guitar into my vocal melody. <laughs> To harmonize myself higher, and it sounds like I sing higher than I actually do. Yeah. Cheating. Yeah, that is che- <laughs> that is cheating, and and I've seen other guys do that too. So that's yeah. not uncommon. But um, David, yeah, we're hit. We're hitting what? We're we're, 50, we're hitting our hour. Fifty six minutes. So you got anything I, else you want to talk about? Yeah, I want to talk about one last thing. I'd be remiss to not mention the. Um, fuzz demos that you've got going on right now. Yeah, they're out there. So I want you to take a minute. I want you to take a minute to talk about a little bit about those, what you've done, and where your plans are to go from here. All right. So I got, I got one demo out. I got two in the can that I have not edited yet. I'm hoping to get a little bit of time to work on one of them this weekend. Um. So we've done. We're doing. I'm doing a series called Fuzz Facts, and it's through the Practical Guitarist YouTube channel. And we're looking at various fuzz pedals that I already own at this point. Uh, thanks, here, no gear. Uh, and then we're going to start analyzing and looking at more. But I, I want to do demos, but I want to make them educational. So the, the the pedal I'm most familiar with and that I have the most credibility teaching about is the, the fuzz phase. And so I've done – we're on the fourth or fifth fuzz phase video. I did, I did the um, – Man of Gypsies Fuzz video, I did the Sunface video, I did the Man of Gypsies versus Sunface video, then I did the last one, which is a four Fuzz Face shootout. So I went and got a Germanium Fuzz Face, I think I mentioned on the last episode, and what I did is I lined them all up on the floor, I ran them in the loops on the Helix, I powered them as neutrally as I could, and uh, we ran the Helix Fuzz as well. So we had the Germanium Fuzz Face Mini, we had the uh, Band of Gypsies, Fuzz Face Mini, we had the Sun Face, and then we had the Helix um, in that mix. So, what what's wild about this is how good the Helix actually sounds, and if you go and listen to the clips, uh, I I did a blind test, so I won't tell you which one it is, but but it sounds pretty damn good. So when you get to the end of the, um, at the, end of the demo, you'll, you'll know for sure, but uh, the point is to educate people, but also to to make sure that like some of this stuff is preserved so that people understand. Hey, you know when you set, when you I I've heard people throw the helix under the bus. Look, it can't do fuzz. Digital stuff cannot do fuzz. Well, let me tell you, it sounds just fucking like a fuzz face. Now, the fuzz face is one of the hardest pedals to get right for everyone because every fucking fuzz face sounds totally goddamn different. So I can go right now, I can go to the store and I can get another Germanium Fuzz Face Mini and it will be some other shade of Germanium Fuzz Face Mini. It's going to be the same pedal, same basic concept, but it might have lower gain or it might it might break up slightly differently because those transistors are so that finicky. Is, right. None of them are the same. And 
if you really want to get into it, they have a trim pot on the board of those pedals. And so if the trim pot from the factory is not set exactly right, it's going to sound different. Yeah. And, and those trim pots have high variances too. Yep. So um, even if you go back into the 60s, I mean, guys used to spend, they'd go they'd go to the store and they'd say, here's 75 bucks, because the flat space was probably 20 or 30 bucks back then. Here's yep. 75 bucks. I want to get in the back room with all your fuzz faces so I can pick the best one. Because they knew the same thing, which was that they're all different. Roger right. Mayer knew it, too. When when Jimi Hendrix came in to do the first record, he uh, Mayer was a friend of his. They, they had met. Mayer had given him an Octavia. And, they had, yeah. and, and then he went to a studio literally that night, and he recorded Purple Haze with the Octavia and um, one of the other songs off that record. But anyway, uh, Mayer was there, and he's like, well, what are you using now? And... There's, they, you can see this is interview, in interviews. He says, uh, Jimmy says, well, I'm using the fuzz face. And Mayer kind of looked at it, and then he went home and he did some research and like looked at the circuit and started breaking it down. And he was like, this circuit's a mess. It's not really well designed, and it's flawed, be- and, and that's why they're inconsistent. So yep. there, there is magic to that, which is the fact that if you get a good one, like you're going to be totally happy, but the problem right. with the fuzz face circuit is even if you get a good one and the and the and it heats up, you're still fucked. You might because they all yeah, sound still different. Sound like crap. So yeah, they're, just... they're the most finicky goddamn pedal on earth, and yep. so many people struggle to find good sounds with them. I have I have talked to so many guys who are like, I won't touch fuzz because I had a fuzz face and it sucked, and it's like, yeah, but okay. You but, gotta ask them two questions. Did you ever open them up and, and adjust the trim pot? And did you ever um uh did you ever try another one? Did I, you bring it back, try another one? I yeah, but I, I mean it's, so the way I feel about it is and, and this is why I think some of the people are still poo pooing the helix, even after hearing my video, because they have. I, I've had some conversations with a couple of people who were like, It's it still doesn't sound right to me. Line six liked it. And line six loved it. But my point, yep. is, my point is that some people are looking for something different in the fuzz face because there's so much variance. They might have owned one years ago. They did right. not have the gain level that the new ones do, and they just – this doesn't sound right to me. Now, right. the funny thing is, and this is what I want to draw attention to. So if you if you watch my video, great. Um, there's another video on um, YouTube of a comparison between the effects in the Axe FX products versus the Helix products. And they look at the fuzz phase, and if you listen to the Axe FX uh, fuzz phase, it's like an overdrive. I don't know what the hell they were thinking. That's not what a fuzz phase sounds like. It sounds nothing like that. Literally nothing like that. And so, and and I've had people tell me, oh, well, the Axe FX one is more close to a fuzz phase. And it's like, have you ever owned a fuzz phase? Have you ever used one? How many have you owned? Because I've had several now at this point and i played right. a lot more than that i've probably played i mean just just the, the one is in memory probably 12 now I, you know i you guys can't see the looks on on uh david's face right now yeah, i'm shaking my head he I'm, is he is i'm struggling just crazy about this because he loves his fuzz faces, I, and I have nothing against him. I don't. I, I'm just not a fuzz guy overall. Not in a, m- most I, people I, hate him because they can't use them. They take effort and time. I, that's exactly right. And I'm the lazy guitarist. I'm a practically it's lazy not, guitarist. I'm not saying or you don't practice. have time. I'm just saying the people that hate them didn't take the time to learn to use them right, or they had a bad one, right? Or they had a really strange one, and they're looking to replace that strange one, and they're never going to find it because it's rare. And it was like theirs was an ano- theirs was an anomaly. That's and that one lesson you should take from that is if you get one that you really love, do not sell it. Hang it is not, on to it. Yes, absolutely. It is not worth selling. You'll never get it back. You never. Um, and I want to I want to end with this. If you watch those of you in the audience, if you watch the uh, videos, watch them and don't think that your hands were shaky. David plays loud enough in that video to shake the camera. Yep. It is shaking in the video. There is a is- proper way to use that pedal, and it requires a loud amp. Oh, well, it doesn't require a loud amp. What it, what it requires is an amp that's saturated, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you have to put the fuzz face out in front of it, which is going to give you a ton of freaking bass. And yep. because of that, I only have a 20 watt or 25 watt amp. So. My camera was, it looked like an earthquake. 
and it, yeah. it is hysterical, but um, <laughs> it was hilarious. I left it. Well, I could so in post, I could have, I could have done, um, uh, what they call it? yeah, stabilization. And I decided not to because I was like, well, hell, this is a fuzz video. This is what happens when you're in the room with a fuzz pedal and it's That's turned cool. up. So yeah. you want to get the experience. It's there. It's definitely there. Even even my wife was like, "Wow, that's that thing was shaking the camera." And I was like, "Yeah." That, I was like, "That's, that's not awesome. even a muff." <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. So we got a muff, so, we got a muff shootout coming and uh that's going to have well, it's not muffs. It's it's I'm billing it as three obscure fuzzes. I am looking forward to that because that is I think where I'm going to find the fuzz that I love. Yeah, I think you're I think you're going to like the end of the world fuzz. That's that's the one I think you're going to be like, "Yeah, I could I could dig that thing." Um the end of the so that that's going to include uh the end of the world fuzz and then I have a demonstration of the end of the world fuzz for good time music. And if they're listening, uh fantastic. Uh I really like your pedal and it'll be reflected in the demo and I'm glad that I'm shooting this thing out. And I'm glad that I'm playing this pedal in a video because somebody needed to do it other than the Tone King. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I want to uh, link his video in mine. I, I think I may. I may I may actually point out, like, look what this tool did. Yeah, I think what you should do is like a reaction video type thing. Yeah. Oh, that's even better. It's like to hype yeah, up just, my video before it comes out. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll watch it, and I'll record myself watching it. And and like I, I I might have to sit on a toilet or something because I'm probably just gonna shit myself. <laughs> I was gonna say plop plop. <laughs> but anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. I I really enjoyed uh, today's discussion. Um, we're gonna do more of these because we want to really um, start talking more about use of the guitar um, and of course pedals um, and what we're gonna be doing uh, more and more. Uh, well, we had uh, the the solid state versus not really versus but. Sound state tube digital discussion this week. Yeah, which, which is think, cool. I I think a lot of people think a digital is a solid state, and they're our they're, our numbers were were really good on that episode, Jim. So, um, so I'm glad I'm glad that everybody's tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, David's been putting a lot of effort. So if you get a chance to get out there to that uh, Patreon page. Um, share, help, help. Hey, if you like my videos? Share them on your personal them. Facebook page. Put them in groups. Tell them, hey, I saw this cool video. Please, Tweet them. we need we need to get people to see this stuff because I think it's really important to, to understand uh, kind of the culture uh, of what I'm doing, but also the culture of these what are now dying pedals. I mean, hell, you can't get germanium transistors anymore. It's yeah. just not a thing. So, I, I share it, posterity. Time capsule it. I will continue yeah. to do this as long as I am breathing. <laughs> yep. Which we're having I, a blast. I have my inhaler in my hand, so I'm going to try to breathe as long as possible. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you for tuning in. I have oh, been Jim. No, no, no. Jim, one more thing. Um, oh, yeah. No, nah, we'll save it for another episode. Good. Cool. So I have been Jim. He was Jim, and I was David. And we have been. For the Practical Guitars. Absolutely. No.